Hey guys, it's Sam Firecatcher here, and I'm here with the first video of a series I've been hoping to do for a while now, and now I'm finally able to. I've been playing this video for a while, and I can finally get it out to you guys. This video will be about the history of the Arizona Diamondbacks, the first team alphabetically in the MLB, as well as my favorite team. Without further ado, let's get into this. The history of the Arizona Diamondbacks starts way before their inception in 1998. It really starts in the late 1940s with the growth of baseball and the so love sport in the Grand Canyon State. Ever since 1946, multiple teams have been doing spring training in Arizona, where the spring climate isn't too unpredictable. Couple that with large amounts of people moving to the state from the east, bringing their love of baseball with them, it wasn't surprising that a love of baseball in the state rose. A love of baseball flourished though, fans had to flock to teams of the Earth Valley Dodgers in order to get their baseball fix. It wasn't until the late 1980s that a serious attempt for a new baseball team occurred. Martin Stone, the owner of the Phoenix Firebirds, which was the San Francisco Giants' AAA affiliate before they relocated to Tucson to become the Sidewinders in 1997, led the bid. He went to Bill Bidwell, the owner of the soon-to-be relocating St. Louis Cardinals football team, to plan sharing a 70,000-seat domed stadium in Phoenix. The dome plan was needed because the frequently over 100 degree summer baseball season was common in Phoenix. This plan would fall apart as Bidwell went with leasing Sun Devil Stadium and having his team play there. Since this was the age of multi-sport stadiums, a baseball only stadium wasn't feasible at the time, so his plan fell apart. The fall of 1993 would be when the next serious bid would occur. The majority owner of the Phoenix Suns NBA team, Jerry Colangelo, announced he was forming Arizona Baseball Incorporated in order to apply for a MLB franchise. Colangelo and his group were so confident that their bid would go through that they held a team naming contest in the February 13, 1995 edition of the Arizona Republic newspaper. The name Diamondbacks would win, beating out Coyotes only due to the name being used for the new NHL team in the area, according to lore. Colangelo's bid wouldn't fall flat like Stones' is, though, as he garnered support from the Chicago White Sox and Chicago Bulls owner Jerry Reinsdorf and Commissioner of Baseball Bud Selig. Having the support, he began to plan. Plans for a retractable roof stadium, which would become Bank One Ballpark, were soon drawn up. On March 9th of 1995, Colangelo's group was granted a franchise to start playing in 1998. While they were given the franchise, the city of St. Petersburg, Florida was given a franchise too, the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. Colangelo's group paid $130 million to the MLB as a franchise fee as well. While the team prepared for their 1998 opening day, they proceeded to hire Buck Showalter, former Yankees manager, as their first manager in 1996. They also allowed their minor league squads to be in play in the 96 season in order to prepare talent for the team. The original plan for the Diamondbacks was for them to be in the American League, but multiple owners of the AL teams threatened to block this due to their fact that more games out of their native time zones would reduce their profits since games would have to start earlier to match Eastern time. In response to this, the Diamondbacks were voted into the National League and the Devil Rays were voted into the AL on January 16th, 1997. While Diamondbacks were in the NL, the MLB held the ability to move them to the AL if needed for five years. Now let's talk about the logo. The original logo that Colangelo's group created was the classic A logo using turquoise, purple, black, and copper. This logo matched the 90s wonderfully and the colors were meant to symbolize turquoise natives of the state, copper that was mined in the state, and purple for the many teams in the state that had used purple. The final step in preparation was a November 1997 expansion draft that allowed the Diamondbacks, as well as the Devil Rays, to stock themselves with more talent for their inaugural season. Finally, opening day of 1998 arrived. On March 31st, 1998, the Diamondbacks hosted the Colorado Rockies, a NL West rival only three years older than them, in their first ever game at Bank One Ballpark, kindly nicknamed The Bob. The crowd attending was an astounding 50,179 people, who all sold out the tickets the day they went on sale on January 10th of that year. The Diamondbacks would end up losing 9-2, with Travis Lee leading the charge in record setting with the team's first hit, score, homer, and RBI. This game would become the beginning of the Diamondbacks inaugural 1998 season, in which they would finish off with a eh, 65-97 record to reflect their new beginnings. 
1999 would be a far more successful season as they would end up with a 165 record, taking the NL West crown, but unfortunately losing to the New York Mets in the NLDS in four games, which was an underwhelming exit for that many wins. 2000 would be a relatively disappointing season as they missed the playoffs with an 85 and 77 record. This led to Show Walter being fired and replaced with Bob Brenly, a former Giants catcher and coach. 2001 would be a far better year for the squad. They finished with a 92 and 70 record thanks to the dominant performances of pitchers Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling and outfielder Luis Gonzalez. In the NLDS, they would successfully beat the St. Louis Cardinals in all five games. Then they beat the Atlanta Braves in five games in the NLCS to move on to the 2001 World Series to face the New York Yankees. It was a truly David and Goliath matchup as the young Diamondbacks were facing a bona fide dynasty that was looking to win its fourth straight World Series coming into 2001. The series started later due to the tragedy of 1911, so it became a far more patriotic affair as the Yankees were represent for representing a grieving city. Both would find a tough series as Diamondbacks would win games 1 and 2 at the Bank One Ballpark, and then drop games 3 through 5 in New York at Yankee Stadium. Back at home, they won Game 6 to force Game 7. The Diamondbacks made one of the baseball's most iconic plays. Gonzalez's clutch RBI was a monumental one as it scored one of the few postseason earned runs against the ace closure Mariano Rivera and successfully concluded the upset against the 90s Yankee dynasty. After this success, the 2002 season would be finished with a 98-64 record. Unfortunately, they would be swept in the NLDS by the Cardinals and returned home for the offseason. 2003 would be worse as the Diamondbacks fell to a decent 84-78 record. The season was plagued by losing Randy Johnson to injury and then Schilling to an injury before they traded him to the Boston Red Sox. 2004 would be even worse. The squad fell to an abysmal 51-111 record, the worst in the MLB. This led to Brenly being fired and replaced by Al Patrique, the third base coach. This wouldn't be the only 2004 disaster as Colangelo's willingness to go for broke to acquire big name players led to the team entering a rocky financial situation. He was forced to resign as managing general partner and eventually sold his shares. For the 2005 season, Wally Backman was hired to be manager until he was fired a whole 10 days later due to legal issues. Bob Melvin, pictured here, was then brought in to manage the team. After a rebuilding period, the squad managed to recover to a 77 and 85 record. Due to the company Bank One being absorbed by JP Morgan, the Bob was forced to be renamed. On September 23, 2005, Bob was renamed to Chase Field. 2006 didn't prove more fruitful for the Diamondbacks as they finished only 76 and 86. In September of 2006, a change in color was announced. This change led to the new wordmark logo, colors, and uniforms, mainly using Sedona red to represent the desert around them as well as the sand color. After these changes, the Diamondbacks would finish 2007 with a 90 and 72 record. They would sweep the Chicago Cubs in the NLDS four gangs swept themselves by the Rockies in the NLCS. 2008, which would mark the 10-year anniversary of the team's inaugural season, would end without postseason action as the Diamondbacks finished with only an 82-80 and 80 record. 2009 would get worse as Melvin was released mid-season and replaced with A.J. Finch. They would still end up with a poor 70-92 and 92 record. 2010 would be even worse as they garnered a weak 65-97 and 97 record, leading to Finch getting replaced by Kirk Gibson. In 2011, they would host the All-Star Game, which went along well with the team finishing 94-68. In the NLDS, though, they would end up losing to the Milwaukee Brewers in extra innings in Game 5. After the season, the Diamondbacks would drop the words from their primary logo and stick with the one they currently have. 2012 would end with a flat 81-81 record, as would the 2013 season. 2014 would be a woeful 64-98 season. Kurt Gibson would be fired after the poor performance and instead replaced with Chip Hale. In 2015, the Diamondbacks ended up with a decent 79 and 83 record. 2016 would end in a worse state though as the team managed a mere 69 and 93 record. This led to Hale then being fired and replaced by the current manager, Torrio Lavulo. 
Lugula would steer the team into a better waters as 2017 would end with a 93 and 69 record. They would beat the Rockies in the wildcard game, would be swept by the Dodgers in the NLDS. 2018, which marked the team's 20 year anniversary, would end with an 82 and 80 record as the team would just miss the playoffs. And here we reach the present. Dimax pushed in the 2019 season, trying to get to the playoffs once again, along with the hopes for their fans. The history of the Dimax is a unique one with lots of ups and downs. The years have been marked with ridiculous success, heartbreaking NLDS exits, and ghastly seasons. But the young franchise remains a popular one still. At the rate this team is going, the team will be sticking with Phoenix for many years to come. That there concludes the history of the Arizona Dimax. I hope you all enjoyed as it took me quite a while to make and plan this. All the images used in the video belong to their respective owners, and I hope that I was able to teach you well what I could. If you guys like the video, please leave a like. If you would like to see some more content like this, please subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.